In this video, we will start our discussion about Chapter 5, Resources in Trade, the Hector Oli model. Okay? And um, this model is named after uh, two Swedish economists, Eli Hector and Bertil Oli. Okay? And uh, up to this point, we should already have uh, some ideas about why countries trade with each other, right? At least, you know, um, from the Riccardi model, we know countries have their own comparative advantages, right? And um, these comparative advantages create the opportunity for them to trade with each other, and throughout the trade, they all become better off as a whole. Okay. I mean, um, the country uh, involved in trade uh, will be better off, right? Uh, however, if we dig deeper in trying to ask, you know, what determines uh, their comparative advantages, then the previous theories or models do not offer much insights, right? So here, uh, the hexer model would help us better understand the determinants of uh, comparative advantage. And uh, this model is built upon, but different from the Riccardi model. Okay? Generally speaking, uh, this is a 2 by 2 by 2 model. All right? Remember we said that um, uh, the first two you know, when, uh, in the previous chapter, when we learned uh, the specific factor model, we said that, you know, the first number two here means two products, right? Cloth and food. The second two means the two um, factors of production, right? Uh, it's capital and labor, okay? And uh, the third two here means two economies involved, home and foreign, okay? So here we write out the uh, production function, okay, the most general form. So for example, the first one here is a quantity of cloth produced in home, and um, the inputs or factors of production uh, involved uh, would be capital and labor, okay. And uh, the second one here is the food production again, which is a function of the capital and labor, okay? And on the right-hand side, the only thing different, different here is just the stars. And in previous chapters, we already knew that star means foreign, right? So this is a uh, um, cloth output or production function and the food production function in foreign, all right? Now, let's um, start our discussion about the Heckscher-Oli model, okay? Uh, we're just going to call it HO model for short, okay? Now, um, here, let's start with uh, assumptions, okay? There are a few assumptions we're going to make before we formally uh, discuss the HO model, okay? The first assumption says both factors are mobile across sectors. So both factors here means capital and labor, okay, are mobile across sectors. And uh, in this case, in this chapter, uh, we will have two sectors, okay, uh, food and cloth. But in the real world, of course, you can see much more uh, uh, sectors or industries. Now, when we talk about the mobility of uh, factors of production, you should immediately recall what we discussed in the previous chapter. Okay, uh, we, over there we had uh, three factors of production: labor, capital, and land. Right? We made the assumption uh, that labor is mobile, and um, capital and land are specific. Right now, here we're saying that um, 
cap, both capital and labor are mobile. Okay, so we don't have land in this chapter. Okay, so both factors are mobile. That's the key difference between uh, HO model and the specific factor model. Okay, it's a key a key difference. Um, how could we understand this difference? Like, why we wanna, you know, assume here that both factors are mobile? One way to interpret this assumption is in this chapter or uh, the HO model focuses more upon the long run. Okay. Now, uh, when we see the uh, factors of production uh, are mobile or move across the sectors, uh, in the real world, it takes time, right? For example, when we say labor is mobile between the two sectors, think about in the clothing factories. These workers, okay, uh, work along the assembly line. They are trying to, you know, making cloth, right? If they quit their job in cloth factory and trying to go to uh, the potato field, uh, let's say the potato farm, uh, producing food. Right for us, there got to be some skills they have to learn. Right, some knowledge like farming knowledge. Right, um, actually these days farmers, you know, they need to learn a lot. Right, uh, from the uh, the quality of the soil. Right, uh, fertilizer, um, pesticides. Right, irrigation. Even the climate change, right? Because they need to, you know, forecast weather, right? So again, um, even we said that labor is mobile between the two sectors. It takes time, right? To for for them to really, you know, go from one sector to another. Okay. Not to mention capital here. So the um, machinery, equipment, tools, right? And we can definitely come up with the examples like, you know, um, we did before during our class discussion, like computer, right? It can be easily, you know, um, put in a cloth factory or a potato field, you know, uh, producing um, uh, or, or being productive or helpful, right? Uh, but, you know, for most machinery equipments, okay, and, um, if you said that, you know, I'm going to use, I'm going to move this uh, big machinery or equipment out of the cloth factory and put them into the potato field, right? And, um, but still being productive, it probably takes time, right? For you to, you know, make some adjustments about that machinery or equipment, okay? So that it can be used in uh, the production of food, right? So again, here uh, one way to interpret this assumption is we're looking at more like in the long run. Okay. Now uh, I hope you still remember from your intermediate microeconomics class, uh, long run versus short run, how we define that, right? So here it's similar to that. Um, in intermediate microeconomics, we said that um, if in uh, your production, there is at least one factor of production it, which is fixed, okay, then it's a short run. If all factors of production are um, variable, in other words, you can adjust the quantity, uh, then it's long run, okay. So here again, it's very similar, the idea, okay. Uh, if one factor or at least one factor of production is specific, then it's more about short run. And if all factors are mobile, then it's long, it's more about long run. Okay. Now, how realistic this assumption is? It is arguable, definitely. Okay. And um, as we said before, you know, some of the machinery equipments they probably would never be mobile. Right, if it's designed and made for 
you know, cloth production, then um, it's hard, you know, for us to convert it uh, for uh, food production. Okay, and even neighbor, we said that you know, currently in the U.S. economy, we still have millions of um, workers out there being uh, permanently unemployed. In other words, they are jobless for more than 27 weeks. Okay. So again, you can definitely argue how realistic this assumption. All right, so the second assumption we're going to discuss here is about how intensively uh, these factors of production are used in production. Okay. Now, um, we're assuming here the production of cloth is labor intensive, whereas the production of food is capital intensive. Now, what does this mean? Using layman's term, we're trying to say that uh, in production of cloth, labor is used uh, relatively more than capital, okay? And vice versa, in production of food, capital is used more um, relative to labor, okay? Now, um, we're going to define this um, more formally later, okay? And um, I, I guess the reason we, uh, as, you know, make the assumption that way is because um, you see, you know, a lot of, especially these days, you still see a lot of workers in our uh, garment or cloth factory. But on the, let's say, the potato field, we actually find that farmers use a lot of equipment, agricultural machines, like tractors, right? So, um, uh, we could say that, you know, this assumption can be held the other way around, okay? I am, um, it's not gonna, you know, hurt anything. In other words, you could say the production of cloth is capital intensive, and, uh, the production of food is labor intensive. That's fine, okay? You just need to change your conclusions later, okay? Accordingly. And, uh, in terms of the methodology, in terms of the reasoning, uh, it doesn't change anything, right? Now here, let's see how we could graph this assumption, okay? Here, um, on the vertical axis, you find the capital input per canary. That's the unit, okay, of food here. So, um, A uh, subscript KF, okay? So again, K stands for capital. F means um, in uh, food industry, okay? And, um, here, the horizontal axis is the labor input per calorie, and um, we draw this uh, um, downward sloping curve here, okay, to show you the import, uh, the input combinations that produce one calorie of food, okay. Now here, if you pick two points along the curve arbitrarily, then it should be quite easy um, for us to understand what's going on. Um, on this curve, right? So point A, you find that um, at this point, um, the producer uses more of capital um, and less of uh, labor, right? Because this is how much labor used in uh, production. This is how much capital used in production, right? Now, suppose the producers uh, would like to move down along this curve and uh, from A to B, then at point B we find he or she actually uh, uses a much less amount of capital but more of labor, right? So again, what we're saying is if we move along this curve, then uh, the output is given. It's uh, going to be the same. Okay, so that's why here we said produce one calorie of food. Okay, so your output level doesn't change. However, you can use different uh, combinations of inputs to achieve that. Okay, in other words, the goal, your production goal doesn't change, but you have different methods to achieve that goal. Okay, so that's exactly uh, what we said. This is so-called the factor substitution. All right. Now, a question I would like to leave for you guys is this. Why this curve is bowed in? What's the intuition here? 